work is going, their support is going. I know uh, Matt Neuheiser over at Calvary Baptist and myself, we've been talking with Ken about possibly having him come out one more time before he heads over to Portugal to uh, be an equipper to our churches as he has in the past. And so I know he's mentioned that they're hoping to head over to Portugal sometime in the next year there. And so there might be a chance we get to benefit from Ken's ministry just once more before he heads over there. Well, go ahead and open your Bibles up to Acts chapter 11, verse 19 is where we're going to be at this morning. Uh, I want to familiarize you with the term this morning, mission creep. Now, if any of you are involved in the military and planning with that, you might be familiar with it. Also, if you're involved in, you know, strategic planning for a company, uh, you also might be familiar with that term because that's kind of where it originates. But mission creep simply is the addition of new tasks, new purposes, new ideas to, which, to the extent to which the original idea and the original purpose for an organization is lost. So let me give you an example of mission creep this morning. Uh, you know, I need to go to town and I need to get bread from the store. We're out of bread at the house, I need to go get bread. And so you say, you know what, while I'm there, I'll also go ahead and I'll pick up these other items at the store and I'll go ahead and get the oil changed on the maybe I can wind down there and meet up with this person for coffee. You go, you do all these things, you get back home, and you realize you forgot to do the one thing that you went to the store to do, which was get the bread. That ever happened to you before? Uh, everybody, right? That's an example of mission creep. There's so much that fills up uh, outside of what you were originally intending to do that you lose sight of that purpose. And I think as a church, mission creep can enter into our ministry. We can get distracted from time to time with all these other things, and we can lose sight of the fundamental things to which Christ has called us to do. I think here, with the planting of the Church of Antioch, we're reminded once again of the fundamental elements of the mission that we've been called to as a church body. That's with the overall theme of Acts. Again and again, we see God's promises, I will make disciples of you, I will make you witnesses to many nations, being fulfilled. And once again, we've just studied the inclusion of the Gentiles into the redemptive plan of God, what that means. And now we're going to see Luke illustrate it through the planting of the church of Antioch. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and read with me verses 19 down through verse 21 to begin. It says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one, except Jews. But there were some men, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenist also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Well, let's go ahead and begin with the word of prayer this morning. Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, many come uh, into this service with different things. Some of us have struggled immensely this week. Some of us had experienced the joys of your goodness. But Lord, in this moment, may we be able to take all these things and be able to hear clearly. Let our lives and our attention be given to you, your word, and the working that your spirit would seek to do in our hearts, our minds, and our lives through it. Uh, Lord, we ask that through the preaching of your word, we might be encouraged in our walks with you encouraged in our witness for you, and built up in these ways. And Father, may we leave praising your name, changed by the glory of your grace and the, the work of your Spirit. And we ask all these things in the name of your Son. Amen. Now here in the second half of chapter 11, we see a focus shift again. The focus now goes back to those who were scattered at the time of Stephen's martyrdom. And now, past couple chapters, we've been focusing on the ministry of Peter. Chapter 10 was Cornelius. Chapter 11, first part of chapter 11 was the summary of that. But Luke now, he goes back and he looks back to the event of Stephen and the outflow of that. And so when we think about this, we aren't to think of this as happening after the events of Peter, but what we read in chapter 10 and chapter 11. And it says, when Stephen was persecuted, the church was scattered, the believers were scattered, and some of them went as far north as Cyprus, uh, not Cyprus, Cyprus and Antioch. I have 
here that I want to show you real quick. And so here, let me get a clicker real quick. My wife has been so gracious to click through the PowerPoint for me because I forget all the time. Um, and she kind of keeps us on track here. But um, you've got Jerusalem, Judea, region. Joppa that we were reading about was kind of over that area. Not the Jews. The Christians being persecuted, they began to head north. Now right here in this kind of mountainous region, you have the Phoenician region kind of along the coast there. Cyprus is kind of the, uh, the island nation there. And then all the way up there at the north, uh, you have the city of Antioch. Now, Antioch was a very big city back during this time, the third largest in the Roman Empire. You actually had three, your three largest cities were Rome itself and Antioch. Um, and uh, and if, just for a point of reference, Antioch was about half a million people. Now, if you want a modern equivalent, Columbus, inner city Columbus, you know, kind of in the 270 belt proper, uh, proper Columbus is about a million people. So take chop it in half, take the inner part of 270, chop it in half, and that's about how big Antioch is. And it was a big city, it was a modern city, first city in the Roman Empire to have street lights, it was luxurious, it was a place of trade and commerce, and it was actually uh, also exceptionally wicked. Religiously, Antioch was a pluralistic and idolatrous city. Uh, some called Antioch the abode of the gods because several different Greek deities were worshipped there. Zeus, Apollos, Poseidon, Adonis, and Tyche. Within five miles of Antioch, the, there was the city of Daphne, which was known for the worship of Artemis, Apollo, and uh, Artistarte. Uh, a cult of, uh, of immorality was present in, the, uh, in, that, in that cult as well. You know, there was one Roman historian that said the moral sewage of Antioch seeps all the way to the city of Rome and pollutes our streets. Now, when you have one unsaved person calling another unsaved person uh, a cesspool of moral sewage, you know that's not the greatest review for your city. You know, Antioch, modern, luxurious, the cesspool of morality. You're right, not a very good tagline for your city. But there was also in this city a large populace of Jewish believers, or not, Jew, uh, not Jewish believers, but Jews. And so naturally, in the fleeing of Jerusalem, many Jews went up to Antioch, where, where there was this hub of Judaism. And they went and they began preaching only to the Jews themselves. So they were connecting with the people whom they had common ground. But it says that there was something different that happened here. There were some men of Cyrene that came, and when they came to Antioch here, they began to preach to the Hellenists. Now this is different than uh, back when we were looking at the Hellenistic Jews in Jerusalem. These Hellenists, and the verbiage here, and the terminology here, refers to Greek people. People who had no understanding of God or the Gospel or Judaism. And what we're seeing here, once again, is the scope of the gospel mission widen. At the very beginning of Acts, you see the gospel come to the Jews who had a deep knowledge of the Old Testament and worshipped God. Then you went to the Samaritans who had Jewish background and worshipped God. You went to the Ethiopian eunuch and Cornelius, Gentiles who were God-fearers. But now you see the gospel being shared with people who had no Jewish background, no Jewish connection. And here we see, or are to see, the gospel mission in its fullest field of view, reaching everyone and anyone. And once again, this is in direct connection to what we've just studied in Acts 10 and 11. We see the gospel now going to the Gentiles, and here Luke is illustrating that by giving a parallel account saying, and this is where we see the gospel changing Gentile lives. People who know nothing about God, the gospel comes to them and they're transformed by it. Now remember the command of Christ in Mark 16:15. It says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole of creation. This was God's command. This was God's vision for the gospel, not to save a select group of people, but to redeem people from every nation for the glory of his name. And what I would have us understand about our mission as a church is this. The foundational act of obedience by which we follow the mission Christ has given to us is faithfully sharing the gospel and sharing it with everyone. Sharing it with everyone. 
And so I want to offer to you two challenges based on this mission that we've been given. This example that we see here in the book of Acts. Share the gospel and share it with everyone. Now, I want to challenge you that the greatest hindrance to Christ's mission will not be the broken nature of the society in which we live, but the slowness of Christians to tell others about the saving work of Jesus Christ. Now, think of Antioch here. This is an extremely wicked city uh, whom a majority of the people know nothing about God. Yet we see multitudes coming to Christ, don't we? God takes the faithful witness of these few men and begins to radically transform the life of many, many people in this city. And this should encourage us, because often as we look outside of our doors, as we read the news, we can see the godlessness, the wickedness of our society so vividly displayed all around us. Right? Uh, this month. Uh, the whole month is celebrating ideas and attitudes and acts that Romans 1 clearly say demonstrate my, man's prideful rejection of God. Yet, if we remain faithful to preach, God remains faithful to redeem. The text says here that the hand of God was with them. God showed His power to do amazing redemptive work in one of the most largest, vilest cities of the time. And when we see that, we have to understand that this same God and His same enablement is present in our church and our lives and our witness today. And realizing that, seeing the potential power of the Gospel by the working of God should cause us to go boldly into our communities, boldly into our society, preaching His truth, preaching the saving work of Jesus. And so the first thing that we need to do is we must preach the Gospel. Second, we need to preach it with everyone. The gospel will move us beyond our comforts and our commonalities to reach people that we normally never would interact with. See, what we're to observe in this text is a group of men breaking the evangelistic mold, if you will. One pastor even referred to them as um, evangelism you know, uh, mavericks. Uh, they're doing something that nobody else is doing. They're going and preaching to a group of people that were otherwise avoided. And what drove these men outside of their normal societal circles? Well, I would suggest to you that it is the same thing that drives us today out of our normal societal circles. And it's two particular things. One, the greatness of what God has done. And two, the greatness of the need in the lives around us. First, the glory of God and what He has done should move us to share the Gospel with everyone that we meet. When something truly amazing happens, we want to share it with everybody, right? Uh, we come in and we talk to people and say, hey, did you see the game last night and this amazing play that happened on it? Did you see the news and the incredible thing that happened there? Did you hear the event that happened? I know this isn't a popular topic, but I, I don't think there's a person in my life that I haven't talked about the pandemic with. You know, uh, Everybody I've talked to, we've brought that up. That's been in conversation. B because it was a huge event, right? It impacted everybody's life. The greatness of it caused the conversation of it to happen everywhere with everyone. But in the same way, in a positive sense, the greatness of God's redemptive work should cause us to say, everybody needs to hear about this. Everyone needs to see and recognize what God has done for them. And I think that's why we as a church must preach the gospel to ourselves time and time again. We must remind ourselves of the gospel work that God has done within our hearts because when we lose our awe of the gospel, we will lose our zeal to share it with everyone around us. And so it is the awe of the gospel that moves us out to say everyone's got to hear this. But also it is the greatness of the need that exists in the lives around us that should move us as well. You know, as I look at people from time to time, I preach to myself this short little sermon. Uh, I look at them and I remind myself, these people need the gospel. You know, as I look at my neighbors, sometimes I'll be sitting on my front porch and just to myself, I'll say, these people need the gospel. As I sit and I have somebody cut my hair, I'll preach to myself that little sermon, these people need the gospel. A and that little sermon is just there to remind myself to view people through the lens of the gospel. And when we see people through the lens of the gospel, we see, to, see them according to the common need that exists in each and every person around us. The need to know and accept the forgiveness and transformation of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, 
what they aren't. Wait, I, I got to sit and think through that sentence a little bit more before I send it real quick. I said, okay, no, I haven't got that worked out in my brain. You know, the differences don't matter as much. The need is what causes me to connect with them. It doesn't matter that they're the same age as me. It doesn't matter that they might come from different cultural backgrounds. That common need is what connects me with them. As I sat and kind of put this together, I thought of the World Trade Center. Uh, I've got a picture, two pictures here that came to mind. Um, this was right after the tower fell. Interesting about this. You know, all the distinctiveness uh, of the different nationalities that make up New York. Uh, they're, they're kind of masked by the ash, right? There isn't black, there isn't white, there isn't rich, there isn't poor. All of that was just covered, coated with the ash of those fallen buildings. And all you had was people who were hurting, people who were covered in that ash needed rescued and taken to safety and cleaned up, right? And I think in the same way, the gospel causes us to look out in the world and not see all these differences, but see the ash that coats every person from the fall of mankind into humanity. And as we look at people, we don't see all these differences. What we see is people who need a Savior. And that common need pushes us out to share the gospel with everyone, regardless of the differences that are there. And so I think it is the greatness of the gospel and the common need of it that causes us to move out and preach it to everyone, to the whole of creation. And so back to our, our, our main idea here. What is the mission of the church? What is the foundational calling of every believer? It is to preach the gospel. Have we allowed things to creep into our life to distract us from that, to detach us from that? Maybe we have lost our awe of the gospel. And once again, we need to preach it to ourselves that our hearts might be challenged, that our minds might once again be open to the amazing redemptive work of Jesus Christ and that might push us out into society and to the lives around us in ways that we've never engaged or failed to engage lately. Friends, the foundational thing that should define the action of our church is gospel outreach. Preaching the gospel and preaching it to everyone. Now the next thing we see here is that we're to be a growing church. First, we're to be a preaching church. Second, we're to be a growing church. Verse 22. Read down through verse 26 with me now. It says, The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came, he saw the grace of God, and he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now the news of what happens here in Antioch gets back to the church of Jerusalem. And they send Barnabas to see what's happening. And we're given just a beautiful summary of this man's character. He was a good man. This is the only guy in all of the book of Acts to be called a good man. He was full of the Spirit and full of faith. Man, that could be a sermon right there in and of itself. Three character qualities that we need to embrace. Godliness, surrender to the Spirit, and to have a life defined by faith in Christ. And it also shows us that responsibility is rightly entrusted by the church to those with a high, visible, spiritual character. Because this is a big job. He's going to investigate to see what's actually going up on in Antioch here. And, you know, they say, well, who are we going to pick to go and investigate this? Let's pick Barnabas. This guy's a godly guy. He's controlled by the Spirit. He lives in faith and obedience to Jesus Christ. And he arrives here, and what does he see? He sees the grace of God transforming the lives of the Greeks here in Antioch. And he responds in two main ways, three actually. He starts by praising God and extolling him for his redeeming work. But he also responds in these other two ways. First, he encourages them. It says, exhorts them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Let me break this down just a little bit. What does it mean to exhort somebody? You know, we don't often talk about exhortation. We don't walk away from a conversation saying, well, I felt very exhorted by that conversation that I had with this individual. Uh, to exhort someone means to 
support and challenge people in a particular action. I think of a parent or a coach standing on the sidelines, right? Exhorting their players or exhorting their child. You know, that's part of the reason I love to go to, uh, to um, some of our kids' sporting events because not only do I get to watch the kids, I also get to watch the parents, and I get, um, uh, I get uh, enjoyment out of both of those. And to watch the parents, you know, way up in the back of the, back of the bleachers, you know, yelling, we didn't practice there. I'm like, they're not going to hear you. What are you doing? But you know, they're there exhorting them, encouraging them, telling them, you know, praising them when they've done well, giving them some positive feedback, correction when, when they need to make some changes there. And I think that's the idea of exhortation there. And what does Barnabas exhort this church to do? Well, to remain faithful to Christ in steadfast purpose. They pursued Christ in faith, and now he wants them to continue pursuing Christ from the depth of their heart. He wanted them every day to wake up and say, I need Jesus, and to let that conviction drive them to pursue a greater knowledge and a greater love of him. Now, friends, from this, I want to encourage you two specific ways. Now, once we come to know Christ, we must faithfully pursue him every day. And, and this is one of the reasons we've gathered together as a church, to encourage each other, to remind each other of that need, of that pursuit that is to be there in our life, to remind each other of the immeasurable worth of Christ and to support each other in our daily walk with him. Hebrews 10, 24-25 tells us how to do that. It says, And let us consider how to stir one another up, to love and good works, not neglecting the meeting together, as is the habit of a son, but encouraging. Now, this word encouraging is the same Greek word as what is being used here in Acts, just a different verb tense. So you could very well put exhorting one another all the more as you say the day drawing near. See, friends, we need the encouragement of our brothers and sisters in Christ. It doesn't matter if you're a brand new baby Christian. It doesn't matter if you've been walking with Christ for over 40 years now. The grace you need to pursue Christ as you need is provided by Christ in a major way through your brothers and sisters in your local church. Now, there are three things about exhortation that I want to note. Three qualities of good biblical exhortation. First and foremost, it is Christ-centered. Exhortation is not like the fuzzy cat posters that people post on their wall from time to, t from time, to time where you have that little... That's not biblical exhortation. Biblical exhortation is always based on the person of Christ, the work of Christ, and the truths of Christ. And exhortation is a call to remember them, to act on them. You know, I would think of a, of a believer here in Antioch. Let's say a new believer comes to Jesus Christ and their community that they are a part of, maybe a temple that they were in, it shuns them, and now they're out on their own. They're suffering for Christ. They need some exhortation, right? And it's not, you know, keep it up, keep following Christ. It's, you know, Christ suffered for our sakes, and now we suffer for His. This is part of the calling that we have Christ to take up our cross and follow Him. And yes, suffering in this life, but whatever we suffer for, exhortation right there. The exhortation, you know, God given us his truth and we need to we need to study each day to know him better to love him. let's get into the word together and grow in him that's the idea of biblical exhortation it is rooted in the person and the work and the words of jesus christ second exhortation is both public and personal exhortation can happen in a very public manner you know in some senses i'm exhorting you this morning but I find that more often than not, exhortation often needs to come in a personal form. Uh, individual struggles need to be addressed and understood and encouraged. You know, a lot of people, they face struggles at work, struggles in their family, struggles in their neighborhood, and internal spiritual battles. And those people need to be exhorted, encouraged, and supported. And for us to do that, I think we have to move beyond just greeting one another as we come and sit down on Sunday morning service we have to get involved in each other's life we have to know what's going on 
that we can carry out this biblical command to be an encourager in each other's life. And then finally, exhortation challenges and support. So it's Christ-centered. It is addressed at individuals, both publicly and personally, but then it also challenges and supports. The purpose of biblical exhortation is not just to make people feel better, but to actually encourage them and support them in their walks with Christ. And a lot of times people do come away from exhortation feeling better. As I've exhorted people, it's encouraging to watch them walk away kind of built up, strengthened up than what they were before. But friends, let me encourage you, that wasn't the work of Pastor Michael. That was the work of the Spirit through the Word of God in their life. But friends, that's what we want to do as biblical believers. We're not here just to help We're here to help Christ. And let me tell you, that can be hard at times. Uh, there can be struggles. There can be sufferings. There can be sacrifices we need to face for living in obedience to Jesus. There's going to be times where we want to give up, give in, and walk away. But that's the purpose of the exhortation that we give to one another in Christ. To remind each other of the truth, to address the issues going on in our life, and to push us towards Christ as we need to be. As we need to be pushed. And this is what we see Barnabas do with these new believers. He says, great, you've accepted Christ. You've put your faith in Him. Now, here's what I want to exhort you to do. Pursue Him each and every day. Grow to know Him more and more. And here's what I want you to see. Look at the impact of Barnabas' ministry. It says they grew in their faith, they grew in their witness, and even more people came to Christ. After this encouragement, we see the gospel ministry increase, right? And I think we're to see the connection here. As people grow in their obedience to Christ, as they grow in their faith of Christ, they should be growing in their witnesses as Christ. And the outflow of that is that you have more people being, making a deeper gospel impact in the lives and in uh, the communities around them. And I think that's a point for us to note here at Walnut Creek. It is not wrong for us to have outreach events. It is not wrong for us to have evangelistic events. But I think the way we will see an exponential in our church for the gospel ministry is in the growth that we help facilitate in the lives of those in our church. You guys follow me there? Okay, good, because I'm just kind of making this up on the spot, and I want to make sure it's all coming out clearly as I get it here. And so, um, not that I'm making it up on the spot. I've thought through all these things, but the way I'm explaining it is kind of a little bit spontaneous. And so, if we want to see the gospel ministry of Walnut Creek increase, we need to invest deeply in the lives of one another, helping each other grow in Christ, grow in our faithfulness to the witness, grow in our knowledge and love of Him. And from that exhortation, I think we'll see a powerful gospel impact happen through our members in the communities that they're in. Just as we saw here in Antioch. They were encouraged, they were exhorted, they grew, and the gospel impact increased through this church. Now, Barnabas doesn't stop there with some encouragement. He goes on. He goes and he finds Saul and brings him back to Antioch for the purpose of teaching the new converts the truth of Scripture and the teachings of Jesus. And they spent a whole year teaching these people. Now, mind you, you're dealing with Greeks. You know, these guys know nothing of the Old Testament, nothing of the laws, nothing of the prophets. There's a lot of teaching work that needs to be done here. And here's the challenge. We need to strive to help people grow in their knowledge of God. We ourselves need to strive each day to grow in our knowledge of Christ. Hebrews 5.14 gives us this challenge. It says, about this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good and evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on towards maturity. You know, the writer of Hebrews here, he's providing some correction here. He's saying, you know what? You guys have not grown in your knowledge and your love of Jesus Christ. You should be but you haven't been pursuing the knowledge of Christ as you should. And the challenge that's being laid down here in Hebrews is that we are to grow in our understanding of God's truth. 
Now let me tell you, I think that's easier said than done. All of us who have been in school, all of us who have been through the educational process understand that learning requires hard work. I can never tell you, I could never tell you that any of my classes were easy. Now, I was never naturally a super smart guy. You know, I always envy those 4.0 people who could come in and do the calculus class with just a little bit of effort. I wasn't that. I was a, I was a B student, and my Bs came with a lot of work. And so, you know, that's where, where I was at. Yeah, those 4.0ers who were like getting their homework done in 25 minutes. I'm there working hours. I'm like, you are awful. And so I can tell you to learn, it required a lot of work, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of time on my part. And I think the same is true if we're going to grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. It isn't something that's going to happen passively. It will require time. It will require work. It will require effort. And I think it's easy to be content with the basics. To say, you know what, I just want the essentials, the bare minimum that I need to get by in my walk with Christ. And I think a desire for ease, a desire for comfort, causes us to fail to pursue Christ as we should. And this is the challenge of Hebrews. To put aside our laziness, to become faithful students of Christ and to grow in our knowledge of Him. Why? That we might one day become teachers of others. Because this is our goal. To see disciples become disciple makers themselves, right? To see people who are new to Christ grow in Christ and then turn around and begin to teach others about Christ themselves. And so first we're to grow in our knowledge of God. But let me, under, let me challenge you. Greater understanding is never to simply lead to greater understanding. It is to lead to a greater love of God and a love of others. We never teach truth just for the sake of knowing it. We teach truth for the sake of being transformed by it. 2 Thessalonians uh, 1.3 says this, We ought to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. If our knowledge of God and His Word does not have a real defining impact on our relationship with Him or our relationship with others, we are just missing the point. We have not understood the purpose of that knowledge. God gives us His truth that we might be transformed by it in what we think and how we live and how we interact with others. If you have all of these theological facts in your mind, but they aren't actually shaped interaction with God and your interaction with others, they are just merit badges on the sash of useless knowledge, guys. God is informative. So we never come to God's Word seeking to know it for the simple fact that God's Word shape the way I love you and the way I love others in ways that point to your glory and your grace. And so, Once again, back to the point. What we're seeing here is the mission of the church being illustrated once again in the planting of the church of Antioch. The first thing that happens is preaching of the gospel. The second thing that happens is the exhortation and the teaching of the church. The believers are encouraged to pursue Christ from the heart more and more each and every day. And teachers come in and invest in them, giving them knowledge, not to just give them a greater understanding of Scripture, but that through that knowledge and through the working of the Spirit, they might be transformed by it. Friends, let me ask you, are these two things true of our lives in our church here today? Uh, Are we exhorting one another in the way that we've been commanded? We often like to think of Barnabas as the encourager of the Bible, but the reality is that all of us have been called to be encouragers, right? Right? All of us have the ministry of Barnabas. Are we providing the encouragement that God calls us to in the life of one another? Are we teaching one another? Or are we still babes who need teaching ourselves? Maybe it's time this morning where some of us have to make the commitment and say, you know what, I've just been settling for the basics. I've been settling for the easy facts that I don't really have to wrestle with. And for me to really grow and become uh, an individual, individual who can minister to others, teach others, I need to be willing to make the sacrifice, take the time, and grow in the hard ways and study the hard things that will require a little bit more work so that I can grow in my love and my ministry to Christ and to others this morning. So the first thing we see is that we are to be a 
preaching church. We are to preach the gospel. Second, we're to be a, a growing church, growing and exhorting in the truth of Jesus Christ. And then finally, as we close here today, we're to be a going church. Look with me at verse 27. It says, Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, named Abigail, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now here's where we kind of see the story come full circle. Some time has passed, the church has grown, and we see the news shared that there is a famine that's going to impact the land. And it indeed happened, it was a historical event, and the church in Jerusalem was struggling, the church in Antioch recognized this, and so they decided to take action to provide some funds to relieve the suffering saints there in, in Jerusalem. And so they take and sacrificially, giving each as God them, raise a gift, and they then send Paul and Barnabas back to the church of Jerusalem to support and encourage the saints there. And this is where we should see the circle being completed. At the very beginning of the account, the church sent Barnabas to Antioch, right? And then Barnabas brought Paul to Antioch. But now what do we see the church here in Antioch doing? Sending them back out to go encourage the church of Jerusalem. And later on in chapter 13, I already preached about this when we had CEF and we see the church here actually send these two men out to go and preach the gospel all throughout the Mediterranean region. And God would use these servants sent and encouraged by this church to change the lives of thousands to really become the, the growing force that would move the church beyond just the, the Mediterranean region. But here they are, giving of themselves, sending from their midst servants to see the gospel work sustained and grown throughout the world. And see, this is where the gospel work comes full circle. We are to preach the gospel, make disciples, help them grow up in their faith in Jesus Christ, then send them out to go make more disciples. We are to make disciples who make disciples. If you want the fancy theological, philosophical term. It's called being a propagating church, a church that produces other churches. And here's what I want to encourage you this morning. Our vision should never just be for Walnut Creek. Our vision should never just be for Baltimore, Ohio. Our vision should never be just for Fairfield County. Our vision, when it comes to the gospel ministry, when it comes to making a gospel impact, should be the world. And the question we should ask is, who from our midst can we send out to continue the gospel ministry in places where we otherwise could not reach? I've heard the church described in these three ways. First is a um, cruise liner. Now, I've never been on a cruise. Any of you have been on cruises before, right? Uh, I've been told the primary thing that you do on cruises is eat. That's why you go to cruises, just to go and eat. There's other stuff you can do off to the side, but you go there to sleep and to Sounds like a pretty nice trip. But you go and you just participate. You're served the entire time you're there, right? You don't do any service. You just go and consume. Uh, the second way I've heard a church describe is that of a battleship. Now, a battleship, I've actually read a book about uh, uh, the events of Wales and the events that that ship went through and in particular one individual on it. But that's where you've got these giant big guns, right? You get all the people supporting the, the work of the big guns and they go shoot and blow up the enemy. And then the final way that I've heard it described think is, is an area where people are sent out, right? You have all these different planes that are there. They're equipped with the mission that they've been, that mission that they've been given, and then they're sent out to carry out that mission. And that's what we should be ultimately seeking to do as a church. All three of these things, but our goal is to see the people who are saved at Walnut Creek, grown up at Walnut Creek, and sent out to sustain the gospel ministry and to reproduce the gospel ministry in ways that are what Walnut Creek all by itself could ever do. And so our goal here as a church is not just to make disciples, grow a big church body here, but to be a sending church body that brings this cycle full circle where we're sending people out as well, just as the church in Antioch did. 
And so, friends, let me ask you, let me challenge you. Are we taking the steps we need to here as a local church? Do we have the vision that we need to? I think sometimes churches are limited not by the mission, uh, the gospel they've been given, but by the vision with which they apply to that mission. You guys follow me there? Sometimes I think we think too small. We think, well, the gospel, we're just supposed to share the gospel here in Baltimore. Yes, we are to do that. Just Fairfield County. Yes, we're to do that as well. But we're never ever to stop there. Our vision is the gospel for the world. The gospel for the world. Well, friends, does our vision need to increase? And does the way we do ministry need to change? Where we're not just sustaining people. We're not just feeding people. But we're equipping people to go and take the gospel out into their communities, out into the world. And friends, you don't have to be a church of 300 to do this. You don't have to be a church of 500 people to begin thinking outwardly. I know one church up in Michigan, I think it was Dallas when he was up, their church, church of 90 people, is already thinking about church planting. It is not about how big you are, it's about the opportunities you have, the equipping that you do, and the sending out of servants that allows you the opportunity to reach beyond just the walls and confines of the individual community. And so friends, let us, by means of the gospel, have this conviction created within us to say, Lord, help us to equip people. Help us to grow people in such a way that we might send people out to sustain, to support, and to further your gospel work in and throughout this world. And so friends, I love Acts because time and time again, it illustrates the same thing again and again and again for us. And that is God doing his work through the saints. And once again, here we see this happening in, full, in its fullest scope here now at the end of, of Acts, uh, Acts 11 here. We're going to look at Acts 12, the that happens in the church. In Acts 13, we see the church going. Paul and Barnabas are sent, and we begin to see the gospel just begin to spread all throughout the Mediterranean region. But right here, with the gospel in its fullest field of view, we're reiterated these fundamental things that God is doing through his people. He is sharing his gospel witness, changing people's lives through it, growing them up in faith, obedience, and love of him and others, and then finally, sending them back out to continue preaching the gospel in the world. Friends, let this be the testimony of Walnut Creek and its people as well. May we be faithfully preaching, faithfully exhorting and teaching, and faithfully sending the saints from our church. Father, as we come before you today, Lord, we thank you for these constant reminders. I know in my life and often in my ministry, I can get distracted from the fundamental things that you have called us to do. And Lord, I thank you for examples like this that recenter our mind on our mission, on the purpose, on the work that you seek to do through us. Lord, I pray that you create within us right now hearts of surrender, a willingness to come and a willingness to do things that you have redeemed us to do, to walk in the good works that you prepared beforehand. Because Lord, if you can give us your mission, you can give us examples of how you seek to fulfill it in and through our lives and in and through our ministry, but Lord, we must be surrendered and submitted to it. Father, if that means that some of us may have to engage people we've never engaged this morning, that we would have to begin to renew our awe of your gospel, that we'd begin to pursue a greater knowledge of your word or a greater heart for your mission than we ever have before. Lord, we desire that. We don't want to walk away merely hearers this morning, but doers. So bring the change, bring the transformation that would bring every element of our lives more and align with you and the mission and the work that you've redeemed us to. Father, we love you, and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen.